quiet. Don't just put this away. Well, good evening. Welcome. Looking forward to this missions night. Uh, we'll have two reports. We'll start with Mike and Jamie from a work in Alaska, and I'll move on to the TLC from there. It's just so exciting to uh, see uh, what God is able to do, even though we've had setbacks and shutdowns, but none of that, none of that surprises God. It don't stop his work from going forward. So, so exciting. We'll pray together. Father, so thankful that you have humbled yourself to the point where you decided it was the best way to bring the gospel was through people sharing it with other people. You could have likely had a more effective method, but in your mind, this is how you designed it was the best way, and so you are co-partnering together with us. We're so grateful, God, that you would even think of us enough to send your son Jesus to die for us, and that this message needs to go around the world and we're so gl glad to be a part of it. So bless these reports tonight, as Mike and Jamie are going to report, and they're the TLC group from their work in Ecuador. Just ask the Lord for you open our hearts to receive all that you have for us tonight, and that we can uh, be excited about what you're doing, not only here, but around the world. So we thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Mike and Jamie. It's good to be here. Um, we had a great summer in Alaska. We are thankful for the opportunity to share that we didn't get sick. We were among COVID the whole, the whole summer and we can be here to share with you today. So the first picture we have um, is just the beautiful scenery that we see when we drive to get the groceries every day. And it is, is this beautiful when the sun shines, but the sun doesn't shine every day, that's for sure. Um, Echo Ranch Bible Camp is located in Southeast Alaska near the capital city of Juneau. And so I have a picture of Juneau coming up here. And you can see Juneau is nestled in between the mountains on one side and the channel on the other side. It is a very beautiful place. Um, we live in Ock Bay. The next picture, please. And this is the house we live in. It's called the A-frame. It's right across the from the ocean, and it's just a, a nice place to live. The camp office is in the, in the bottom of this building. Here's a map of the area. You can see Juno down on the bottom, circled in red, and then 12 miles up in the purple is where we live, at mile 12 in Ock Bay, which is a small little community. And then 28 more miles is Echo Cove and Echo Ranch Bible Camp around the cove. Um, from Echo Cove, it's another two-mile drive around the cove to get to camp. If it's low tide, I would be driving a four-wheel drive pickup around to camp. It would be lots of bumps and rocks and deep sand and muck and water splashing everywhere. And I don't know, these guys can't imagine that I would be doing that, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a little intimidating at first, but we do that. Okay, the next picture, yeah, it shows a little bit of driving. This is probably the best part of the trail. It's one, one lane, and yeah. This was a day that, that Jamie got asked to drive the four-wheel drive pickup around for the first time this summer, and she was really nervous about that. I said, you can do that. They had a tire tractor that had to go to town to be fixed, and I had the refrigerator truck. It had to be to town, and she followed me, and now she is an official outdoor woman. <laughs> Yeah. She liked it so much, she had to keep doing it. All right, and if we can't drive around when it's high tide, we go on the landing craft, which is, our, which is a Blondina, and so we load it up on there, and that is an experience in itself, driving onto there when the, the waves are pushing the, the boat each way, and, you're, and it's about a foot and a half on each side. You just got to close your eyes and go. So... <laughs> Echo Ranch was homesteaded by Alan and Catherine McMurchie, and they donated the land to Gospel Missionary Union, which is now known as Avant, to be used for a Bible camp to reach the children of Southeast Alaska with the gospel. The first camp was held in 1964, and something that we didn't realize until the 50th anniversary, we actually, we didn't go in 64, obviously, we, we were alive, but we were, we were too young. Um, we went the first time in 84 when the camp was only 20 years old 
and now it's already over 50 years old. So we've seen a lot of changes at the camp as well. Summer camps are divided into different age groups each week, seven to nine year olds, 10 to 12 year olds, 13 to 14 year olds, and senior high camp. Registration was held at Echo Cove. So all the parents drove their kids, all the campers there, and stopped at each station until the campers met up with their counselors. When we would pick up campers early in the morning, there was always a 6.40 flight Monday morning that came in from Sitka. We also had to take these campers to the end of the road and drive through the registration line. And they would load their luggage into that one vehicle you see down there. And then the campers and their counselors would hike the two miles around the cove into camp because the campers didn't get a ride and, and can't take them on the boat because of liability. Um, work teams are always a big help to the camp. And you know, if we'd want to get a work team from here, they would be more than welcome to have you come. This, they're building a new camp a staff home here, right on the, right close to the beach there where they have a beautiful view. Um, here's a finished pr picture of the, of the house, the next one. And these teams help with building projects. They work in the kitchen. And counselors are also volunteers. And I'm looking at this age group right here. You need to be at least 18 years of age. And you can apply through Echo Ranch Bible Camp, which is a part of Avant. And you can spend the most exciting summer of your life in Alaska working with kids all summer long in the most beautiful setting that you would ever find and the most spiritual I think you would have the most spiritual growth that you've ever experienced in your life. So keep that in the back. You guys can keep that in the back of your mind. <clears throat> and we spend lots of hours at the airport. Just sometimes just sitting and waiting with kids to leave. Because when unaccompanied minors come, we cannot leave the airport until the plane leaves the ground. And so Jamie and I look at each other and we have to go through security. We say, oh, finally, we can relax a little bit. We don't have to do any work. We can just sit here and be with these kids. So, um, Our duties included transporting people and campers to and from the airport and from the ferry. And it's a different situation going to see, meet the ferry. These ferries connect the outlying small villages in Alaska with Juneau and is their lifeline to food and, and whatever that they need. This next picture, another time I was out of my comfort zone when I had to drive Old Yeller, that's the name of that pickup. They told me, you're driving this pickup onto the ferry and you're just gonna leave it on there and you're gonna walk off and, the, and it's gonna go to our camp in Haines and they're gonna use it in Haines. And I thought, okay, I'll do this. And so I got there, I had to get there three hours ahead of time, had to sit in the parking lot and wait until these guys come out and they survey the whole parking lot and they put you in there in the order that these vehicles will fit according to weight on the ferry. Um, Haynes is located about 90 miles north of Juneau, and this camp property a few years ago was donated to Echo Ranch, and so now they have two camp proper properties where, where kids can go. Um, Echo Ranch Haynes is used for retreats, day camps, and youth groups. Okay, so there are youth groups that come there and they volunteer and help in the city of Haynes. They also help fix up this camp because it needs help being fixed up. There are, the buildings need help, the trees need cut down, the, everything needs to be fixed there. So that may be another option for you guys to bring some people, your kids to go work as a youth group. Um, we also took um, people, campers, and supplies to camp. And these uh, next pictures are just some of the sights that I saw when I was driving to camp. The mountain ranges are majestic and beautiful. Lots of bears, they're not very far, they're right on the side of the road. And I pulled over right beside them, I don't know, I, I didn't want a picture, so. The dandelions, the dandelions are two feet tall along the side of the road in the month of June, and so the bears like to eat those. So we saw maybe seven to nine bears almost every time we, we drove, so. And then the sunsets, I, I didn't edit this picture or anything, that's exactly how it was, it's just that beautiful. Other duties we had besides transporting campers were providing overnight housing when needed. And this meant lots of laundry, making beds, and cleaning at three different places. The dorm, which is next to where we live, and there's another house on that property near the dorm. 
Then there's the lake house, which is a half mile away, where we'd sometimes keep people. And mowing was another thing that also needed to be done. This is the lawn at the lake house. It's about a, I don't know, 45 degree grade down to the lake. It's very steep anyway, I don't know. And uh, each property had to be mowed and took about an hour and a half at each place. We also checked the mail each day and filled the vehicles with gas whenever needed. Um, we shop for groceries twice a week for Echo Ranch Juno and once a week for Echo Ranch Haynes. The majority of our shopping was done at Costco. We'd spend probably two to $3,000 each time we went buying groceries. So it was a lot of loading into that truck. Um, they were nice enough to provide a couple to help us one day a week. Um, and it was nice to have someone younger to help lift some of the things into, into the truck. Uh, we also picked up other supplies too. I mean, they'd, they'd uh, call from camp and they'd say, we need this and we need it right now, so go get it. Okay, so we, we, we could do that. And here we are by the grocery truck, the couple that helped us. Thank you for your financial support. This money was used to fill the gas, that, uh, gas in the vehicle that we drove all summer. Some of the money was used to help pay for our airline tickets. And we also used the money to buy meals for some of the campers and other people that we picked up. If it was campers, it was usually McDonald's and other people often it was just Subway. So thank you for the financial gift. And these kids to go to McDonald's is a treat because they come from these small places where they had never get to go to McDonald's and you ask them when you pick them up, are you hungry? Oh yeah. Do you want to go to McDonald's? Yeah. And so <laughs> that's what we did. Um, and thank you most of all for, our, our, for your prayers. We appreciate the prayers for us to have the strength to do the work we were asked to do in Alaska. God is faithful and he has supplied the ability, ability for us to help with some of the behind the scenes work for the camp. Thank you all very much. Well, I might argue with you whether Ecuador is more beautiful than Alaska, but yeah, you'll have to go to Ecuador. <clears throat> we just want to share a little bit about what God did through us. Uh, it's already been over two weeks ago, but uh, we finally got to go. And uh, so Brooks put together some pictures and we're going to have some of the kids talk about them. Hopefully there's not too much of a break, but uh, uh, thank you very much for supporting our group. Uh, I know a lot of you gave individually. Uh, I know the missions committee did a great job with, with uh, giving out applications and, and allowing us to uh, be supported that way. And then we had some prayer supporters, which were, were awesome too. So we ask each of the kids to have three prayer support uh, as we were gone and so uh, we're going to go through these pictures and we'll probably tell some stories and uh, here we are Saturday morning about uh, five o'clock getting ready to go uh, another answer to prayer was that the the Mead school allowed us to have Travis drive the bus so we didn't have to have a Continental Trailways bus come out here and and uh, spend five thousand dollars to get us to Wichita. So that was that was pretty good. I'm gonna sit down and. Uh... Oh no. Okay, I'm gonna tell this story. Uh... We uh, I I like to check U version because they always have a verse of the day. The verse of the day for Saturday was Ephesians 3.20, where God says, where, where it says that God can do immeasurably more than what we can ask or think. And I shared that with the kids. And we get over here to Wichita. We've all had our uh, COVID tests. We've all passed, we've all, all negative. And we get to Wichita and we find out that our time has elapsed on those, those uh, tests. And so I just over there praying because I thought, well, we're either going to go or we're going to come back home. And I thought, we're not doing all this again and coming back home. And uh, 
So my prayer was that that God would just change those people's minds behind the desk. And Jeff and Angie and and Corey and Don, they were arguing back with this person. And uh, yeah, they were doing it nicely. And <laughs> and we had we had some of the group who got together and prayed. And I was sitting there just thinking, you know, we we're gonna go. And uh, what the final story was was that they wouldn't not, they wouldn't let us go, and I was just I was just devastated because I thought that's what that's how God was going to answer it. And so uh, Corey and Don said, "Well, is there a place here in the airport that we could test again?" And they said, "Well, there's there's a place upstairs that." They're there sometimes, sometimes they're not, and this is Saturday, and it's Saturday early, so we're not sure that anybody's there, and they ran up there to, this, to the place, and the manager was at the, at the place, and she said, well, she says, I'm usually not here on Saturdays, but uh, we can try to get your group all tested and done, and we, we had about an hour left because we'd, I, we'd, we'd already argued for about an hour, and so time was wasted. And uh, what was neat about it is that Angie and Dawn, uh, she said, just sit behind the desk and start filling out forms and helping me. And, and I couldn't, we couldn't really tell who was in charge, whether it was Dawn or, or uh, Angie or this gal. <laughs> but uh, we actually got 20, 22 people because six of them already had had uh, shots, they didn't have to be uh, tested. So we had 22 people through in 39 minutes with negative results. All, all, all 22 people. So. I guess the thing that kind of hit me was the Mead Health Department tested us all for free, which was amazing. We get to Wichita and they said, well, it's going to be $250 a person. And I look at Corey and Corey just says, we're doing it. Because I did 22 times 250 is right at seven grand. And I thought, how are we going to, how are we going to come up with $7,000? And then I realized that we'd already invested about 75,000 in our group and that another 7,000 God would take care of. So uh, we were eating breakfast after we'd all been tested negative, and there was a person in that restaurant that heard the kids talking about it, and he came up and he just laid a $100 bill on one of the kids' table, and then he went to another table and laid another $100 bill down. And uh, just, I mean, it was just a neat lesson on generosity because he didn't know us from Adam. And I know $200 doesn't do much for it. She, she uh, actually ended up letting us have them for $200 a piece. So it was $4,400 that we were out of. And here, uh, a man that didn't know us had already knocked $200 off. But... Uh, that was a good start to the trip. Uh, if, if you like a little stress and a little uh, trusting God, realizing that God doesn't always answer prayers the way you want them answered, but he, he did answer that. So that's a long story, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the people a little bit that the kids will probably mention um, while we do the slideshow. But the... Um, Two people in the middle, those were the missionaries, and then these, and their names are Chet and Katie, and then those are their kids. Uh, Brooklyn is the girl, and then Skylar's next to um, Brooklyn, and then Tanner. So um, their kids weren't there, but we were able to work with Chet and Katie the whole week and stay on their property. And then I know the kids are going to talk about um, Maniwa and Jericho, and I'm not going to share that anymore but when they talk about them these are faces to who they are talking about and this is the same this is um meepo and we were able to work with him all week and then maybe if this works so this Huh? 
<laughs> well, great week. Okay, so this guy was Freddie, and he worked on the grounds with us a lot, and then this is his wife and then his um, four kids. And then this boy right here is Billy, and we were able to um, work with him a lot, and he was the kids' age, which was very handy as well. So I think... Um, I'm going to show you a video of the grounds that we are at, and then the kids are going to share um, as well. So that building right there is the guest house, so that's where all the kids and, like, the, most of the leaders stayed up on the top of that. Kids stayed on the bottom. And then that's just, like, their water tower. And um, then this house that you see right here, this is Chet and Katie's house, and a few leaders were able to stay in the house with Chet and Katie. <laughs> And then this hut right here, this is where the Raudani have church every Sunday. And then this right here is um, the wood shop that they can work in as well. So that's just a little bit of the grounds that um, we were able to have the opportunity to stay at. And then... Um, this was actually the backyard of our property. Um, so the first day that we were actually in Shell, um, we got the opportunity to walk the whole border or boundary of the property. And so um, they had this little river that went through there. And it looks very nice in the picture, but they call it the Poopy River. <laughs> so you try not to fall in. We had a few fall in. And then... Um, Every morning we took these drops, and so we had three drops. They didn't taste the best if you asked the kids, so, um, but that was to help, us, help keep us healthy. And now I will let the kids talk about our work projects. Okay, so this is one of the main work projects that we were doing. We were spreading kilo to make a new soccer field for the kids at their VBS that they were working at all week. And... Kilo down there is decomposed granite. It's our version of like, we would use gravel and stuff while they use Kilo. It's very cheap. And I think they had, they dumped two truckloads for us to spread out over this uh, soccer field to make it for the kids. So we had to level it out and then use the wheelbarrows and the shovels and everything and spread it out. And so we got done with it on the first day. And then, uh, I think it was Maniwa goes, make it bigger. And so to, in order to make it bigger, we had to use um, some of the pitchforks and hoes and stuff and had to chop away at the yard to even it all out. Um, and then they kept saying, make it bigger. So this project lasted um, a good portion of the week, three days. Uh, but we did get it done for the kids to play on um, Thursday and Friday. And they had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it rains a lot in Ecuador. Didn't know if y'all knew that or not. But with the rain, it creates potholes. So after every time it would rain really, really hard, we'd have to go back and re-level everything and spread the kilo out. But yeah, there we are, chopping away at the, at the yard. And then, yeah, now we're playing on it. <laughs> um, no, but it was a lot of fun and... I don't know, that's where I worked most of the week, and it was hot, but it was a good time, good time. No mas. Okay, so here we're digging away a lot of dirt for their new welding shop so they can learn how to weld. So this was the first day, and then we would throw, <coughs> shovel it into wheelbarrows, and then we made a nice path under a bridge and dumped it into the um, jungle, which was really cool. <laughs> <clears throat> and they were very particular about having straight lines everywhere. So you would drop a rock on the wall and wherever it bounced, you had to clear that away. And it had to be four feet or four inches below the concrete so we could lay more concrete down. And this took most of the week. I think we started on Monday. And by Thursday, we were done shoveling to lay concrete on Friday. 
So this was right before, and then concrete was really cool to watch. I think everybody had at least 20 loads, and there was five wheelbarrows going, so that was like 100 loads. And it was really cool to watch everybody work because it was a team effort, and everybody knew what they were doing. Here we lined up, and then they would tip the mixer over and into your wheelbarrow, and off you went. And it was fun because you would load it up, run it down to the welding shop, and sprint right back up for another load. So it was really cool. Here's, and I don't even know what this stuff is, but they would they had exactly a certain amount of each material, and they'd pour it in there, and then it would somehow come out perfect. <laughs> and here's Leo. He loves working with concrete, so we stuck him with this job. Him and Freddie had a blast. And this was the last day, Friday evening, and it was complete. So uh, this was one of uh, Ryan and I's projects. Uh, it took two days, uh, for the most part, to complete this. And we had to make trenches along the sidewalks. And so uh, we were trenching along the sidewalks because, as Lily said, it rains a lot in Ecuador. And so we had to dig at a certain depth. We had to dig at a certain depth, and we couldn't go too deep. Otherwise, if you stepped off, you'd roll your ankle really bad. And so here we are, still trenching it out. A uh, funny story that happened while we were trenching. Uh, we came along a rocky part. We came along a rocky part, and uh, so I got to use the pickaxe. And as I'm using the pickaxe, we see, well, I see what looks like a tree root. So I go to pull it out, and next thing I know, water is gushing out, splashes Ian all over him, and come to find out, we had popped a water line right at the connection that Chet had no idea was there, so that was fun. Luckily, since it was at the connection, it was really easy to fix, but definitely something that made us more careful after that. Um, well, this is a this is pictures of us landscaping. Um, most of it was doing tree removal, like uh, in that picture, there was uh, trees that were covering the driveway, and we had to remove them, otherwise they'd fall on cars, which is not very good. I don't know how to get to the next picture. Okay, <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, and then there we also had to weed whack because. Uh, the government, you, Chet told us that the government used to take care of that, but the way they would was that they would just spray chemicals onto the grass, and he did not like the chemical runoff that would run into the river. And then there's Leo, who is power washing the sidewalk, which was very nice because I'm pretty sure Ian slipped on the sidewalk once. So. And there's more pictures of us removing trees, I mean branches that were hanging over fences. And then this is something for someone else to talk about. So me, Jeff, Ian, and Jonathan, and Zach all did electrical. And that is in the wood shop. And we were putting in 110 and 220 outlets for their welders. The uh, hardest. The hardest part was probably running the four small wires for the one tens, believe it or not. Then there's Jeff putting in a new yard light. And then that's in their welding shop where we are putting more two twenty outlets in. Okay, so we had some welding projects to do. <clears throat> um, I would say that my sidekick 
over there was Corbin Clawson, but as you can tell, he's doing the welding and I'm the sidekick. <laughs> so right there we are building a new wood shed for him. Uh, the old one was made out of bamboo and they chopped down a tree and the tree smashed their wood shop. So we're building one out of steel for him. And when we're done, all the, everybody joined in, even the little kids on helping fill the wood shop. Another project that we had was uh, building new gates. Um, so as you could see on the sidewalk, uh, that was just wide enough for their lawnmower to go from one side of the property to the other. Um, but the gates were not big enough, so they had to take their lawnmower down the main highway, which was pretty sketchy. Um, so we were building new gates to widen up um, the entry to both sides of their property so they get their lawnmower to their side safely. And uh, another project we did, they had some swings there, but they, all the seats were uh, decaying and, and rotting, so dry rot, well, probably not dry rot, wet rot. Um, so we cut the chain links apart, put the new seats in that we brought, and welded the chain, link, chain links back together. More pictures of the very unstable woodshed. So uh, every morning we had uh, we have four different teams, um, color groups, as we went to just keep track of everybody. Uh, then when we got down there, um, the different color teams were either in charge of making the meal or cleanup. And so this was one morning uh, when we did breakfast, and usually that team had to wake up 30 or 45 minutes earlier than everybody else, so it was ready um, before we started the day. Uh, the meals consisted of usually um, eggs and bacon or pancakes for the breakfast. So one afternoon we um, all took a little plane ride. Um, they could fit five or six of us in a, in a, I guess just five, in a plane. And uh, we went, they took us just to see what the area looked like so that we could see what a jungle looked like and, and just the whole area, some waterfalls. And we did this in place of other years we have been able to fly into an, actually into the jungle. And that was our hope this time too. Um, but the week before we left or before we got there, um, Grandpa Dewey is what they call him. He's one of the um, killers of the five missionaries back in the 60s. Um, and he passed away the week before we got there. And so that was the jungle that we usually fly into. And he would meet us there and he'd pray with us. And it was always a really neat experience. And we were hoping to do that again. But because he passed away, they felt like it would not be respectful to go in there kind of like you know, tourists. And so instead we did this little um, flight so that everybody could see what the area looked like around Shell where we were staying. Yeah, and I don't know if you knew, but all the, the there were five killers um, of the missionaries and all five have become Christians, became Christians and a lot of their family became Christians. And um, in fact, um, Maniwa, who you saw a picture of earlier, and Meepo, they are both grandsons of the killers, and they are now um, very instrumental in the church, the Wadani church that's growing there in Shell. So every morning, um, we would have devotions, and it started the first morning uh, just um, Freddie uh, came and uh, he shared uh, kind of what was on his heart and uh, then every morning was different. Um, some, uh, there would be three or four people that would show up and then uh, maybe half hour later another person would show up and uh, so 
it was mainly just a time where uh, those guys, um, the Nationals, would kind of just share what was on their heart and they would share their testimonies. And it was a, it was a really neat experience. Um, and before the week started, uh, Chet kind of warned, I mean, not warned us, but kind of told us what to expect. And he said that he just started doing this with them. And uh, he said, yeah, we have a later start to the day um, by having these devotions. Um, but usually our work is multiplied. Um, he says, I don't know how it works, but he says usually you have a more productive day when you uh, start off with having those devotions. So uh, we saw that put to work. Uh, most mornings we started at 1030 and uh, we still cruise through the work that we needed to get done. So it was a valuable time. These other pictures are our evening debriefs uh, where we just, uh, Chet and Katie would challenge uh, the kids and the adults in uh, just one different area every night, and so we would share what, we're on, what was on our hearts, um, what we had learned, uh, what God was uh, really working on us uh, through these. And so uh, these were um, neat times because we got to see how God was at work. Um, um, it was very an intimate time. Um, a lot of tears were shed uh, just because it was, you could see how God was um, tugging at different hearts different ways and uh, so um, I would say that was one of my um, neatest times of just to, to hear the kids and just be able to, to share um, about how God was working in our lives. Okay, so one of the things we did each day throughout the week was help with a VBS that they put on. And um, we were divided up into different groups each day. And so, like, we had a rotation going. And I think we got to do it each, like, a couple days um, throughout the week. Um, here they're just playing different games. They had – well, they're about to play games. They had divided into um, Team Red and Team Yellow. And, oh, this was one of the fun games they did on the first day where they would pop the balloons with the little kids. <laughs> that was really fun to, as we worked with the Kilo back there, we got to watch them, the group that was helping with VBS that day. And there were lots of different games that we played with them, lots of basketball, lots of soccer. Um, here I'm helping with one of the little girls with the crafts um, that Brooke put on and playing on the Kilo and all the playing soccer, and that is some hard stuff. Like, those kids are very talented. <laughs> and we just don't know what we're doing half the time. Uh, Maniwa and Mipo were kind of in charge of teaching the lessons, and they would use the crafts that Brooke brought to like um, teach the gospel to the little kids. And there are more crafts. <laughs> and we played, um, or we pushed them on the swings and played on their jungle gym. <laughs> and more basketball. So each day we had like an average of probably 60 kids, which was really amazing because this was like the first thing, or this was the first time they've ever done like a VBS like this. They've been praying for it for three years and um, it was really special that we could be a part of it. That van back in that other picture, um, we got to go to pick up the kids and take them home after to and from VBS. And I think when I was with um, Nate, one of the um, missionaries down there, I think I turned around and there were 23 kids in the van with us. <laughs> yep, 23.
And that's the whole group on Friday, I think. Okay, so usually for supper, we would have it at um, the guest house that we were at, or we would, um, but a few nights we were able to go to a restaurant. So this was um, one restaurant that we went to, and it's called like The View, because um, this is where it was at, and so it just had a great view that we were able to eat at. Um, so this is just our whole group eating one evening. And typically the meals um, were either fish or chicken, so they'd always say, well, we have some options, and they were always fish and fish or chicken, so um, people did not really want to see that once we got back to the States. <laughs> yeah, so one of the days that was kind of like our final unwind day after we had finished all of our work jobs was to go to, uh, get on these boats and go across the river to a little island that had sort of like a plant exhibit slash like history thing for the uh, tribes people there. And so uh, we got on there. A few of us got to hold a uh, python, right? A boa constrictor, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, a few of us did that. This is just another picture of the group of people, I think with Leo and Debbie after yeah. this. This is a group of us, or all of us, in front of the Nate Saint house. That's a nice smile, Ian. <laughs> And uh, this is from this is from Sunday, all right. Uh, and we all did the church service with the Warani people, and that was a really cool experience. We got to sing uh, some Warani hymns. They handed out little booklets that were written in the language. And so it, we even recognized a few hymns that we sang in English that uh, they had translated to Warani. That's all of us again with the uh, people after church. <laughs> So if you couldn't tell from that video, that was us singing, like, oh, be careful, it lies what you see. And so I think we only sang that one in Warani, but uh, we had some of those songs that we just knew from children's hymns. So I'm going to talk about this. Um, so this was just a really cool waterfall. Um, took forever to get to. <laughs> um, but... It was just a really fun day. This is a different waterfall. Um, that is what we rode. And <laughs> um, how that was going, it was really very interesting. Um, so farther back this way, if you could see, um, there was a guy with a lever, and he had a motor, a diesel motor, apparently, and he would send us out, stop us right before the waterfall, and then send us farther in, and we'd kind of go into the jungle, in a sense, jungle, um, and then he'd bring us back, all with, like, perfect precision, and it was all by sight, which was, in a sense, really sketchy, but that's fine. Um, but if you couldn't tell in the video, basically everywhere you looked was beautiful scenery and I was so glad we were able to go on that and go across because that was just a really cool experience to do. And yeah. I think we have enough time. I'm just going to have everybody come up real quick. Maybe share... Uh, a fun thing that you did and maybe something that you took away from the experience. Uh, by the way, you see that on our shirts it says MAD. And what's that stand for? 
make a difference. And so it says, go mad. And it was really a neat conversation piece for in the airport and, and things. People would say, go mad, what's that mean? And so uh, it was kind of cool. And in our verse that goes uh, for our trip was Hebrews thirteen sixteen and do not So that was our verse, and uh, let me just start here with Brian. <laughs> I thought you'd start at the other end, but okay. <laughs> um, I guess one thing that I thought was really um, interesting from the trip was that at the house we were staying in, they had these Bible, they had these books there, and they were very thick, and what it was, it was the translated version of the New Testament into the Warani language. And one thing that I think it was Connor, Zach, Golden, and I noticed was that it was really, really long, because in the, in the culture of the Warani, they have to be extremely specific, because if you're in the jungle and you need to give someone directions, you can't just say, oh, it's over there or, oh, it's right over there, because there's a bunch of trees and cliffs and things that will kill you. So <laughs> it was very interesting seeing how, what lengths they had to go through to translate this New Testament to spread the Gospels for the Rwandi people. And, it, and Chet told me it took over 20 years for them to write, make it. So. One thing that I thought was really cool was the teamwork that was shown, whether it was helping each other through the Poopy River or sharing each other's load during the work projects. It was really cool to see and be a part of as well. Um, so one thing that I thought was really cool or an eye-opening thing was um, no matter what happened, good or bad, everybody came together um, because we had an experience that week um, that was kind of shocking. Um, ask me about it afterwards. <laughs> um, and just to see everybody come together and either be happy for each other or to come together and pray with each other and lift each other up. Um, that was just an amazing thing to see God working through everyone, including me and just everyone there. Um, one thing that was cool to me, um, uh, the amount of trust that a lot of the whole Ronnie had, like especially the little kids, um, like when we were doing VBS and stuff, like how much trust they had. Um, for us and like they just like let us play with them um, without like a second thought so that was really cool and that just showed how much like Meepo and Maniwa have like um, built trust toward them and then if they trust us then why wouldn't the little kids so yeah I thought that was cool. Uh, so one thing that I thought was really cool was um, those those kids they, they come from humble places uh, but Whenever we would play with them at VBS, they always had so much joy in their eyes and their, their faces, and their, their faces would always light up every time we'd just even hug them, because some of them, that was the first hugs they would ever get. And so it was really great to see uh, just how much joy they brought and uh, how content they were with their situation. Uh, one thing that was interesting to me was all the I guess Freddie and Meepo and them, they would share their story. And as Chet said, that they usually don't do that with people. But I guess they had enough trust in us to do that. Uh, one thing I really enjoyed was the teamwork, uh, especially with the dirt crew, because that took a long time. And then two, there was these giant blocks that we had to move. So when we worked together to try and figure out how to get them up a hill, that was also really encouraging. One thing that I thought was pretty cool is how we had to power, use a power washer all the way across the swaying bridge and clean a sidewalk and bring it all the way back. So, um, whoa. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel like God really used the VBS to uh, change my heart the most over the week um, due to minor injuries and illnesses, I got to help at VBS more than the rest of you guys, I'm sorry. Um, but, um, so I got to work with the little kids. So I helped with VBS on the very first day and the kids, you know, they're like little kids. They didn't really know you, 
you, they, we couldn't communicate because they're speaking Spanish and wow and we're speaking English and very broken Spanish. And so you can't really communicate and so they're, they're a little bit hesitant. Like they'll play with you but they wouldn't come up to you and like hug you or anything. Well then I came back again on Wednesday or Thursday and there's just such a difference in those kids and they would run up to you with their arms up. You would have like, you'd just be standing there and there'd be like two or three little girls that would run back and forth and they'd want to be picked up and they'd want to be held and kind of like what Zach said, uh, it's not their culture for to hug their kids. And so some of these kids have never experienced that before and we got to teach them what it feels like, like to be hugged and to be loved in that way. Um, and then I started thinking, um, you know, my siblings do that to me and they come up to me with their arms up and they say, hey, I want a hug. And I'm like, no, just go away. I hugged you already this morning. And they're my family. And these little kids that I can't even talk to are coming up to me five times within two minutes wanting to be hugged and I'll pick them up and hug them every time and say hi and have this huge smile on my face. Why should that not, why is that any different for my siblings? And so God really used that to show me how horrible I've really been <laughs> through high school to my siblings. And, but that was just really cool to see the change in those kids as they learned to trust us and love us and let us love them. Um, a highlight of my week was probably the VBS as well. Um, I really liked the time after it was technically done. We were able to play with the kids, and I don't know any Spanish. I think I knew like two words in Spanish. But they would, I would play with them on the jungle gym, and they're really strong. And like a little kid wheelbarrowed me like two yards, and she was like, Five, <laughs> and it was just really fun to hang out with the kids and even though I couldn't understand what they were saying it was fun to see them and play with them so kind of like Zach and Lily said all the kids came from almost nothing and they had so much joy so it was encouraging to come back and like always choose joy through every circumstance we go through Okay, so I had more of a privilege to um, assist Mipo and Maniwa in the VBS. So this was um, something that they've prayed for three years, like Yana said. And because we were there, we were the answer to prayer is what they kept saying to us. And so um, they did the whole VBS. We were just there to assist. So um, we brought down five crafts. And just like a miracle story with that was um, they do not plan ahead like we plan. And so we already had the crafts planned and packed, and Chet and Katie already knew that. And so, because they had asked them what they wanted, and they're like, ah, well, they don't plan, so it was going to be a while before they decided. And a couple days before we were getting ready to go, they came up to Chet and Katie with two ideas, and they're like, well, those are great. And they just took them, and not telling them that they weren't going to tell us, but they're just like, well, those are great ideas. And... They're like, well, I know their bags are packed, so we're just not going to tell them. And um, then we really got to see God's hand work through that because we showed up, and the two crafts that they asked for, we had. And we brought the salvation bracelet with um, the red, the, bl the black, the red, the white, blue, green, and yellow, um, just to sh share the salvation story to them. And then um, the other one that they asked for was a Polaroid picture. And of all like crafts that we were able to pick from, we brought down 80 Polaroid pictures for all, all, to take pictures of the little kids that don't ever have a picture of themselves. Like they have them on like phones sometimes, but they never have a printed picture. And of all things to that, they requested that. And then that's what we brought like how do people not believe that there's a God for that to happen? So that was just incredible. And um, I just had the privilege of watching these kids interact with the little kids. It was very adorable, and even though that they couldn't um, share the same language, it was, I would always hear Ian or Kiana, like little names being shouted out. And um, it was just awesome to see these teenagers love on those little kids that don't have that. 
Yeah, so mine, like everyone else, was the kids and the VBS and everything. And kind of like what Brooke was saying, like just hearing them like yell our little names, like or yell our names everywhere, like throughout the week, because they just grew so many relationships with us. And that was really special to see from day one to like day five with them. And there was like one day where I didn't even help with VBS, but like I was done working. And I walked over there just to like play with them and everything. And like four girls just like little four-year-olds just ambushed me and they were like, Kiana, it was the cutest little thing ever. And they were just the sweetest kids and I will never forget them and they were really cool. So something that was eye-opening for me was after VBS and before, some of us got to pick up the kids and drop them off and seeing like where they come from in their houses, they're not really houses. Uh, Maniwa's house, like one of his walls is a tarp. so where he comes from and he still comes every day and helped us and he has like nine people living in his house and they're all together crammed in this little shack and the kids are the same way have these big families and they're coming happy and you would never know so uh, my favorite part of the trip was specifically the uh, bus ride on the way to the boating trip because in the very back row of the bus, we had Jonathan and I sitting at opposite sides on the windows. And then in between, we had Billy, Minewa, and Jericho, or his uh, Warani name is Bobe. And on the way up, Jonathan and I were getting to know the uh, natives, and we were like learning Spanish from them. A very broken Spanish. I don't think any of us are fluent now. But uh, about three-fourths of the way through the trip, uh, Bobe gets out his uh, Minewa's phone, and he starts playing music. And it's uh, just gospel music, like that we have here in the States, and it's in English. And uh, it was in English, he was singing along, and so he played that, and then he played another song, and we just had our small little group in the back of the bus singing hymn songs in English on the ride up there. And I just thought that was really cool, because there's definitely a language barrier that we were going through the whole week, and then we were able to break it for just that time to worship together. So that was a really fun part of it. Kind of as has been mentioned before, uh, we had devotions every morning, and um, like they said, that even though we get a late start on work, it seems like our work is multiplied because we took time to honor God uh, with our day, and it's it just it's something so simple. It doesn't take a whole lot of time in the mornings to to have a five minute devotion, um, but just that intentionality with God to start your day um, really changes your perspective on on what you get done. So. Uh, that was just a good reminder and, and something we can all bring home and, and work on uh, to help our days go better. Well, the best part for me was probably in the evening after we got done and <clears throat> we'd do the debrief and you could hear the kids' passion for what happened that day or just their hearts that were opening and that's when they, to me, what the whole mission trip was about was get to the root of why we're there. So that was probably the best part for me. Um, before we went, I hadn't really thought about it, but uh, as we kind of got there, I thought, I wonder what God's going to show us this week as to why we're here now and not a year and a half ago. And uh, it was pretty clear to me that uh, God had used the last year and a half um, and gave these kids challenges, gave us adults challenges uh, to work through and prepare our hearts um, to receive what we received while we were down there. Um, it was shared during some of the de debriefs how much struggle these kids had had, and yet God had allowed them to work through it, and so their faith had been built. And uh, just by waiting and seeing and finally being able to go, um, it was kind of clear that God needed to, needed to work on us before we could go down there. And then hearing the, the um, Meepo and Maniwa say that they had been praying uh, for this for three years and uh, finally being able to do it and it was just so happened when we were down there it was kind of kind of clear as well and also um, the the wow church has really taken off um, since covid and so we were able to really see that and witness that and be a part of it and it was awesome and uh, just another thing they had all ordered all the metal and all the supplies for that uh, welding shop, and that was supposed to be our big project. And so they had all that and all the food and everything. They were ready because we were 13 hours from leaving last time. And uh, when everything shut down in Ecuador, I mean everything, that street that's 
you see probably oh, 50 cars every five minutes or even more than that. That street was shut down, clear from Shell to, to Quito. There was no travel during COVID. And so they weren't able to get any supplies. They weren't really able to do anything. And so during that time, Chet and some of the nationals, they had all the material that they needed. So they had something to do. They, they had a project. They built that, that roof on that welding shop. And it took them, those, Chet and those guys, the majority of that time. But they got it done. And they were thankful that they had that material in hand in order to, to keep themselves busy. And then they used that food to, to give away to people that couldn't go get food. Um, because everything was shut down and they had food to kind of live on and so God used all that stuff that we sent ahead of time for them during that time of need and so uh, it was pretty clear how God was working in that and then another thing that uh, always impacts me on any trip we take whether it's Ecuador trip or just the uh, summer retreats is it's clear we have something special here and, and God's at work um, but it's because of these kids and their intentionality. It's because of you parents and your intentionality in raising these kids. But we never have one ever have any trouble with them. Um, don't have to worry about them getting up and um, being on time anywhere. They usually, except for Ian. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, they're on time. They show up. They work hard. Um, they're well behaved. Um, since Heather didn't come with me, I was able to be with the, the guys and be with the kids most of the time. And it's, it's just a joy to be around these kids. Um, and uh, so I hope we can, don't lose that. Uh, the culture is really fighting against us on that. Um, so stay strong parents, uh, stay, stay strong kids. Um, it's very important that character quality will, you can take with you the rest of your life and hopefully pass that on to your kids. But uh, um, it's something, something special that this community has uh, that I think a lot of uh, youth groups and the leaders of those youth groups would wish that um, they, could, they could go on an overseas mission trip and not worry, have, have to worry at all about how their kids are going to act. So um, that's, just, that's just a blessing every time. I have to ditto what Ryan says. That's always a highlight for my year, whether it's short term, I mean, close by. Uh, work retreat or missions trip. It's just so fun to spend a week with these kids. Um, the other thing that really impacted me this um, trip was just the missionaries' lives. Um, you know, they serve a big God, but we serve the same big God. But they trust that big God to do amazing things. And sometimes I don't trust that big God to do amazing things. And just to look at their lives just really spoke to me. Um, Chet and Katie, I don't know if you know their story, but they lived in um, Orange County, California. That's where they grew up. That's where they were living. Their plan was to retire by the age of 40. And they were on that track. He was a financial planner. And they both had masters. And they were living those dream lives. And then God called them to missions. And, and you look at what they do now. I mean, they actually have a house in the jungle where it just has a wood floor and a wood stove. And they love to go spend, they, I mean, they live out in this house, you know, just maybe a couple times a year now. But, it's a t you know, for a while there, they were living with the Wadani. And they love that lifestyle. And it's because they see what God is doing in and through the Wadani and how he's using them and what a rewarding life that is for them. And um, the same with Nate and Rochelle. They're the other couple that are helping Chet and Katie there now. And um, Rochelle actually grew up. Her parents were missionaries in the jungle. Her dad's the one that actually uh, wrote, put the Wadani language into print. And um, so she lived her first 10 years in the jungle. And uh, then she went through severe um, health issues. And I think for 20 years or so, they were in the States. And she actually spent about six years in a wheelchair because of Lyme disease, which triggered MS, and just some real severe things. But God has healed her back to the point where now she can function. And they're back in, in Ecuador serving. And... Um, 
during the time that she was suffering with Lyme's disease, she became pregnant and she had a, a child and that child suffers with Lyme disease and she's now in her 20s, but she lives here in the US and she really struggles to get by, but yet they were willing to um, sacrifice and live in Ecuador serving God with the Wadani tribe and leave their daughter here in the States with her grandparents who were helping take care of them. And I was just really impressed by these missionaries who trust a big God to do big things through them. And sometimes it's scary to take that risk to trust God. And, and uh, I was challenged to do more of that. Uh, some of these kids have gotten notification that they've had one more vacation Bible school since we've been there, right? That was on Wednesday, I think. And so they had a little less turnout, but they had a little less help too. So uh, we hope that it just keeps going and, and that these kids come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Uh, thank you guys for being such an awesome group. And... Uh, we just covet your prayers for TLC this year. Just uh, if you think of us, pray for us. And, and uh, there's quite a few that didn't make it tonight. And so you can ask them about their story if you, if you see them. But the leaders were awesome and so were the kids. So, And uh, one other thing. If we would have gone a year and a half ago, we wouldn't have had Jeff and Angie with us, and they really needed uh, electrical advice down there. And so that was another thing that, that was uh, a good thing. So thank you for coming. We're going to play that one video we did Sunday. As you're walking out, you can either stay and watch it, or I think it's about four minutes. So thank you very much, guys.